Um, hello, folks. Welcome to Journey to Healing, and I'm John Euler. Welcome to Journey to Healing. Do you find yourself discouraged, troubled, in need of healing, but not sure where to turn? John Euler, a licensed professional counselor, is here to help. John has more than 25 years of professional experience helping people deal with the issues that keep them emotionally and spiritually stuck. There is help. There is hope. There is a God who loves you and wants to help you find peace and strength. And John Euler is here to help you find that on this edition of Journey to Healing. Hello everyone, I'm John Euler, and this is Journey to Healing, and I am still getting used to the technical aspects of uh, doing this live, so bear with me. I'm a better clinician than I am a technician here. Um, we're in the middle of doing a, a series on grief and loss. We've spent a number of weeks, and we're going to spend one more week on some preparatory remarks to really help someone get a sense of whether or not they have anything that is unfinished that may have been uh, should we say buried alive they thought uh, time heals all wounds so they moved on yet maybe something is unfinished and therefore it's down there doing a number on them and they don't know that so we're looking at what are some of the symptoms so if you're not um, able or willing to take my word for the fact that the majority of issues that people deal with are in one way or another connected to grief and loss those are people that typically seek out counseling. Uh, those that should seek out counseling uh, may be hesitant and they may be minimizing some of the things that are going on. And that's where a topic like this hopefully will be helpful. Others that should seek out counseling may end up behind bars in a way. Uh, so that sometimes is a, a hard wake up call for them. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that uh, there's a uh, little text box there if you'd like to communicate with me if you would like to uh, ask any questions I will be mindful to look over to my left and see questions as they come in if not if you would like to ask a question sort of confidentially or if you would like to have a question answered over the air but you don't want to use uh, the text box then go ahead and uh, send that to survivorsupport.net that is the sponsor of our program and that is a tremendous resource if you or anybody else has gone through something very, very difficult. If you're a survivor or if you would like to know how to better assist those going through the healing process. So we're picking up on, again, the sort of the intro to grief and loss. And the reason it's an extended intro is most people are unaware that they have stuff under the surface. All they know is typically they have stress. And we covered that, how the body absorbs emotions that don't have a way of coming to the surface so if you have stress we all have stress life is stressful jesus said in this life you will have difficulties but there's a difference between as well as good things create stress but there's a difference between life kind of stress versus things that have piled up to a point where they aren't able to come out you've been carrying them for so long you've almost gotten used to it and then things start to happen. Things start to break down. Your body starts to break down. We covered that. And we have to take care of our bodies. The bodies will absorb the ills of things that are um, stuck under the surface. So it's important to be able to take care of ourselves and to keep issues current. That is a key part, I think, of what devotions or quiet time or, or spending time with the Lord is all about. It's us trying to I'll use a, you know, an Eastern term, but I don't think it's Eastern, getting centered, getting to a point where you know what's going on, where you can discern issues that are unattended, uh, unattended to, that there's things under the surface, or whether or not you have peace. That's the thing the Lord gives us. He wants us to have that. So the extent to which I do not have peace is the extent to which something is going on. And the Lord wants, he wants to reveal that to us. That's why he is the wonderful counselor. And once I'm able to discern that, I will be able to experience his peace. And part of that is I'll find that I'm walking in the path, the path of life in his way. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which is a key counseling verse, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Why? Because he has a vested interest in it. Uh, Psalm 23 talks about, he makes me lie down. I think that sometimes if we're not willing to, then he may make us in one way or another, or allow us to burn, da- uh, burn out, and then we're, we, um, we lie down. But it's interesting, he makes us lie down in green pastures for our own good, but it says for his name's sake. So because he cares about us, and also, in a way, since we represent him, he wants us to be able to show people by how we act, by how we respond, by how we are, what the Lord is like. And so how am I doing as far as representing him? I think so many young people leave the church. There's all sorts of studies. Why are young people leaving the church? I think um, the majority of it is they have not seen in a consistent and healthy and reasonable way. They haven't seen Christ-like characteristics lived out behind the scenes. So they see mom and dad acting one way. Um, There are times that uh, one of the spouses may be a Christian. Maybe they assume the other person's a Christian and so for a couple of different reasons, maybe issues aren't forced until somehow something comes to the surface. It can be, for instance, one of the kids doing something and you thought everything was sort of together, but you were absorbing a lot of it. But then again, maybe there was disciplinary issues. Maybe there were, uh, maybe one of the spouse, here's a, a key indicator, by the way, if somebody, if you want to try to figure out if someone's a Christian, because the Lord's going to create his uh, life in someone. And so eventually there should be a decreasing frequency of sin or decreasing frequency of junk, right? Um, If you have someone who claims to be a Christian, but as you live with them, it's almost like, you know what? It's always something and it's never enough. After quite a few months, certainly after a number of years, but probably after four to six months, it's important to start thinking in terms of whether or not this person is or isn't a Christian. And maybe, depending upon the kind of um, stuff they're creating in the home, somehow you're going to have to implement boundaries. But if it gets severe enough, you're going to have to separate. Separation is a very legitimate option that is not uh, discussed enough in churches. Read Proverbs 26, Uh, chapter 26, 27, and 28, and you will find out what we are told to do if we're interacting with, let's say, a fool. Now, a fool can be someone that's calm, cool, and collected, but is still very willful. So you can have somebody that is impacting the family, and it doesn't have to be, let's say, just the violent alcoholic. It can be someone who is very stoic. You know, that's a very powerful way to motivate people by withholding, withholding in a lot of ways. But by withholding, it's almost like standing on the um, oxygen tube of a scuba diver. You're standing on their oxygen tube. You, you, you know, as a matter of fact, right? You can kind of look like, what? And meanwhile, you're killing them slowly. You're cutting off their oxygen. And that happens, I think, all the time because I'm pretty convinced there's a whole lot of people who go into churches, attending churches that aren't Christians. They think they are, or they wear the label, but nothing has happened in their heart of hearts to cause them to relinquish their willfulness. That's the human condition. And it actually takes the work of God. None of us can remove, although there will always be selfishness even for Christians, but that ultimate and initial sense of relinquishing our our right, our right to do it my way, as Frank Sinatra said, right? Uh, the uh, Jim, Va- uh, Jim, thank you. Good evening to you. Um, I've got the, I think I've got the volume going, so we have progress going on. So again, one of the most powerful of dysfunctional ways of dealing with things, if not hurtful, is a very passive approach. 
So you can have two things that have any, any extreme. So you can have the very overt, very extreme. We call that emotional reactivity. But emotional reactivity can also be the opposite. A person can explode or a person can, can do an emotional cutoff. Either way, nothing is resolved. So the definition of a dysfunctional family is one that is tension reducing, but never tension resolving. The issue never gets dealt with. It never gets, it's never finished, but it goes, it's swept under the carpet, becoming a landmine, requiring everybody to tippy toe around that, like walking on eggshells, lest what? Lest the person get triggered. And a couple of weeks ago, I used the phrase, um, and this is a very dysfunctional phrase. This shouldn't be. We laugh about it, but if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Okay. No disrespect to mama, <laughs> but the reality is this: if you, have, sorry, if you have anybody in your family that's walking around acting like king for a day, queen for a day, and it's not just a day. Right. If somebody walks around basically saying, if I'm unhappy, unless I'm happy, what? That's really bad. That that's that's almost an emotional terrorist because I am holding others hostage and I know it. And that's the one thing you can be guaranteed. Somebody that creates chaos in a family, tension in a family, someone that causes people to walk on eggshells. Ready? Here's the little secret. This will this will be worth two or three months in counseling right here. They know it. Now some people say, well, wait a second. They were they were raised that way. They've never seen any well, here's how you discern. If in doubt, here's how you discern. Have you ever seen that person turn it on and turn it off when it benefits them? Can they be reasonable and nice and pleasurable and uh, personable? in public when it benefits them. Have you ever seen that? How many kids see that at church? All of a sudden, the doors open of the car, fighting was going on all the way to church, and all of a sudden, the person that was causing the majority of the problems, I think it's safe to say that, you can have a black hole person in that family. And all of a sudden, no one in the church knows what was going on. They don't know what was going on prior to church. Uh, I'm not saying we don't have challenges, you know, because there's time issues and inevitably somebody's going to be late. Um, but overall, you know, everybody's entitled to a, a bad day. We're not talking about a di bad day or a bad week or even a bad month. What are we talking about? We're talking about a character trait, uh, a character. We're talking about disposition. We're talking about the overall feel, the wharf and woof, the ebb and flow of a home. And everybody kind of knows who that person is, it's sort of calling the shots. It may be that somebody's calling the shots on one level, but under the surface, who is it that's sort of running the thing? That's the toxic person, and the kids are paying for it. So here's how you discern uh, whether or not the person actually knows. And why am I talking about this as we move into, this is actually the topic of grief and loss, but why talk about this? Because so many people have lived with so much stuff for so long, they don't even know the extent to which they were impacted. Because we think that time heals all wounds. And so now, as adults, we think we left that behind. Some people think, well, that was back in California. That was back. I'm out in Pennsylvania. I'm out in Florida now. I left all that. Really? The problem is I take me with me. And so if I have stuff on the inside, or if I have uh, character traits, how about codependency, that fancy little term, that simply just means this. I want to make people happy even to an extent that it harms me. And I think that happiness actually is godliness, and it's not. Okay, you'll never find the word happy, and you'll never find the word nice in Galatians 5 in the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Um, but we, we feel as though our job is to make someone okay. That's sort of the concept of codependency, that I'm okay as long as that person is okay. And therefore, where do I spend my energy, my time, effort, energy, energy and resources? And by the way, that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7. It says, if you are dealing with someone who has become a selfish pig, so that's why we have to discern. 
Because what will a pig do? Do not cast your per pearls before swine because they will trample your pearls, that which is important, your time, effort, energy, resources, you. So they'll devalue that. They'll disrespect it. And then what are they going to do? So that's bad enough. But now they're going to add injury to insult, sort of like that. Right? Then they're going to actually turn on you. And they'll certainly turn on you if you try to turn the spigot off. And that's why if you attempt to implement boundaries without going through the process on the inside of being prepared to do that, you are going to crumble. Because if you need the other person's agree agreement or cooperation to implement a boundary, it's not a boundary. A boundary presupposes at times that the other person is not going to agree. Why? Because if they were thoughtful and sensitive, they probably would have already apologized by now and stopped doing what they're doing. So in order to be able to work through emotional issues, you have to be aware of to what extent you've been negatively impacted. And you have to resolve that. And part of that will be grief and loss. So first you have to know, were you impacted? And that's why we're taking this time. Um, the other way to discern whether or not the person knows is do the right thing, which is be very biblical, which is what? Speak the truth in love. So if you don't know whether the person knows that they are negatively impacting people, well, there's always one way to find out. Come up with a way of having that conversation. It, it doesn't have to be a knockdown drag out. And trust me, it's probably not going to, it's not going to be well received, typically. Why? Because if it was well received, you wouldn't be anxious about having that discussion. A part of you knows they are not going to be receptive. That shows you already that this person already knows. Because if you then speak the truth in a reasonable fashion, if you are stating your preference and that person gives you pushback, meaning they're pushing back your boundaries, your preferences, what are they telling you? They're telling you if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody. <laughs> okay? So they are already telling you they know. So if in doubt, dispel all doubt and guess what? Ask them. Okay, but if you've seen, as a matter of fact, somebody today, a great phrase, don't, um, don't believe their words, believe their actions. Okay, what are they like at home? So if you see that they can differentiate, because crazy people can't differentiate, people that are intellectually deficient can't differentiate, so they'll be very consistent. But if somebody can turn it on and turn it off, treat other people outside the home nicely, why? Because there's something in it for them. Then you know they can differentiate, and so they're making a choice. And the question is, what's most important to them, or who is most important to them? One of the things that that can produce, then, is internalized anxiety for kids, because kids need a relatively stable environment, including the emotional environment, to develop the way they're supposed to. Why? Because a child has a lot of jobs to do, and I'm not talking about taking out the trash. They have a lot of jobs as far as figuring out the world, a lot of jobs as far as figuring out how to interact with people and how to resolve issues and how to discuss things. Also, what are they good at? What gifts and talents do they have? Hopefully, they're also learning about empathy. Well, it takes a child in a setting where a child can be relatively calm so they don't have to worry about as where anything around them or behind them. They can just focus on life and doing the things they need to do, going to school, but resolving issues. But if they walk into a situation, a home, where there's tension, and probably, probably tension from who or from whom, could be siblings, but ultimately... It's going to be mom and dad. Well, then a kid can't relax, and a kid then starts to involuntarily try to figure out, sorry, I lost my screen here, um, try to figure out how to bring tension down because they're going to be driven to make sure two things, that their world is okay and that mom and dad are okay. But if that tension continues to rise, they will do something. And those that have 
uh, theorized and, and worked on what's called family systems or family systems theory. They postulated, and it's very correct, that when you have somebody with issues, they can have issues, but it also may be that their issues have come from a context. They came out of a situation. So when you look at kids and there's tension, they will be driven. It's not a conscious decision. They will be driven to, in a way, distract mom and dad from being tense with each other. So all of a sudden the child can't be a child any longer. They have to do what? They're sort of now what's called survival modes, or they're going into survival mode or adopting what are called survival positions or uh, survival roles. And so they will start to act in a certain way. Typically, the firstborn child will be overly responsible. That's not always the case, trust me. But the first child is usually because mom and dad are arguing and if the child can just be good enough, because somehow in that argument, inevitably, the parents are going to talk about the kids. Somebody's going to talk about the kids. So you have um, the family uh, hero, so to speak, the really good kid. That's the overly responsible kind. The next person or the next kid will tend to kind of do the opposite, but it's not always the case. Not, but it tends to kind of track in birth order. But you'll certainly see these kind of roles taking place where a child begins to adopt a certain way of approaching life and relationships. So one is sort of an overachiever, uh, overly responsible, being good. They're driven to do the right thing. Why? So that they don't cause any problems, so that mom and dad don't argue, so that the, the black hole person doesn't go off or doesn't go away. The next role can be what's called the black sheep. And most of us have heard that term. That came out of um, John Bradshaw and Claudia Black back in the um, late 80s, early 90s. You can go on to YouTube. Uh, go on to YouTube and look up uh, those two individuals. They've done a wonderful job. Um, so you have others. You have the, the class clown or the family clown. That breaks things up with humor. That was a little bit of my role in my family. So uh, sometimes I uh, will be driven to lighten things, uh, lighten the atmosphere sometimes. Um, and it just comes automatically. And how do you know if something like that's going on? Ask yourself the next time you, or the last time, either way, the last time you were with your family or the next time you get together with your family, how did it go? Were you calm? Or did you eat too much? Did you drink too much? Did you, what are those things? Those are chemicals. Food is a chemical. So you're, you're numbing yourself. That is self-anesthetizing. Why? Because if you didn't have those in your hand, what would happen? Some truth might start coming up. So if a family has to have a lot of food or alcohol, uh, there's a balance. But what you'll often find is if there's issues under the surface, you're also going to find that in that atmosphere, there's going to be a lot of food and a lot of alcohol in some way. Why? Because people have to keep their hands and mouths um, busy and the carbohydrates are creating a chemical high in the body. So it, it mellows you out. And that's why also if you're around somebody that you can't stand and you get away from them, like adult children that now get away from their parents, um, let's say they visit, and what are you going to find them doing just after that? They're going to drink, or they're going to smoke, or they're going to eat. Why? Because they're trying to manage their emotions. So if that rings a bell, by the way, that probably means you have some unfinished business. And therefore, you would benefit from going back and looking at not just the current, but also looking back at what is driving some of this. And there's a need for attending to some of the losses, grieving that loss. There's a, an interesting, or there was an interesting study, Dr. Wallerstein out of UC Berkeley did really the one and only or most groundbreaking longitudinal study on looking at the effects of divorce. Now, why do I suddenly bring divorce up now? Because if you have two adults that can't get along or something's going on, eventually what's going to happen? You can end up with a divorce. Depending upon the age, sometimes divorce should happen sooner. If there are grounds for it, separation should happen much sooner than I think it is. But let's say a divorce happens. The question is, what was going on before that divorce? You had those same dynamics that I just explained. Tension, kids not being able to be kids. They're, having to be, they're so worried about other things that they're not able to just be themselves. 
So they start to get a sense about people, about relationships, about themselves. A lot of blame, a lot of false guilt is being placed on them. So that most kids, when they're younger, if they experienced a divorce, they will conclude somehow it was their fault. And it's not their fault. That's the big people, and they need to work things out. So what happens to children whose parents eventually ended up divorcing? As um, no-fault divorce was coming in vogue, you had changes in the 70s and then changes in the 80s to where eventually there was, quote-unquote, no-fault divorce. So the, the rates of divorce went up. Now, again, I'm not talking about situations where there should be divorce. If there's infidelity and it's just not working anymore, um, then the folks, uh, the family shouldn't suffer with that. Um, but the question is, what, what are the effects? Are there? Because there's a lot of folks, a lot of researchers who are trying to say, you know what? All things being equal, kids are resilient, kids will be okay. Okay, but how do we know? So Dr. Wallerstein did a 25-year longitudinal study. There's my hands, right? Longitudinal. So what that means, it, they tracked kids. They tracked people starting when they were kids at various ages and stages. And they started out with a lot of them, a couple hundred. But then over time, what happens? You lose track of them. So it's amazing that, um, I forget the numbers, but it ended up with, um, with a good size sample. And forgive me for forgetting how many, but enough to make it very eye-opening. I'm going to have to go back and look. But you can Google her research. And she found that there were a number of effects that weren't readily apparent, but had, as it were, gone down deep into these kids that as they moved into adulthood and began establishing themselves as, as singles, but then finally connecting with people and starting their own marriages, their own, their own families, there were some things that started to emerge and there were some issues. Given the divorce rates and given what's happened in our culture, in our country, it's probably reasonable to assume that there's a lot of us, there's a lot of people whether I ex experience divorce or not, but there's a lot of people that are sitting in churches that are carrying a lot of wounds and don't know it and think that, well, it's in the past. I came out unscathed, so no actual wounds. It ain't bleeding, broken, or burning, so it's okay. But meanwhile, they don't realize they have some deep inner stuff that is doing a number on them. Their body is feeling it. They go to church or they meet with people and they have a smile on their face, but on the inside, they feel like they're slowly dying. Yet they don't know that it may, in fact, be connected to something. Now, does that mean your past is going to predict your future? Not at all. But the question is, if you were in a car accident and somebody rear-ended you and you slammed your, you know, they rear-end you, and every part of you goes back into the seat, you're probably going to have a what? There you go. So after a few days, though, your neck will probably start to feel a little bit better. I've met a lot of people that have been in accidents, right? That at first it's really stiff, and so eventually, though, it starts to lighten up. And what happens? They move on in life. But the question is, did something happen? And just because they don't feel it now... Oh, thanks. Um, somebody complimented me. I appreciate that, Ken. Um, but the question is, just because I don't feel it really now, is there something? Is there some emotional internal injury that I'm carrying with me that I may not be connecting with, but is it affecting me? And so the question is this, as we take our break, here's an indicator. We kind of discussed this last time, but you look at your body. Do you have a lot of stress? Do you have stress-related illnesses? How are your relationships? Are they hot, cold, back and forth? Does it start to drive you crazy when things get still or calm? Do you feel guilty because the most you can do is sit down with your Bible for a few minutes and then after that your knee starts to shake? As a matter of fact, when you sit down and does your knee start to shake? That's a pretty good indicator. But here's another thing. Do you have buttons and triggers? Do you find that if somebody says a certain thing or looks at you a certain way, it just sets you off? And again, either explode or implode. 
do you also automatically or immediately shut down? And then some of the um, mental health disorders, as we call them. Do you have depression? That doesn't go away. And you've gone to the doctor and he says you're okay as far as thyroid and other things, your endocrine system. Do you have anxiety? Do you have panic disorder? Do you have panic attacks? Do you have nightmares? Uh, do you find uh, somebody tells you that you scream in the middle of the night and you aren't aware of that? Do you tend to forget things? Not being forgetful, but do you lack, are there chunks of time that you miss during the day, during the week, during the month? Do you have a difficult time recalling much of what happened in your past? Uh, do you tend to hear things in your head? And people make fun of that and we kind of, right? But there, there's, there's a very real phenomenon. You go through trauma and you'll experience what's called dissociation. There's a whole, there's a ton that we can talk about, and sometime we will talk about that, but that's important. Do you feel sometimes you detach? You can almost see your body. You can almost hear yourself talking. You sort of go away. Um, do people tell you that you change up? And that's an important indicator also sometimes of dissociation. Do people say that you have mood swings, but during the day? If you have mood swings that are cyclical over weeks and months, that's probably bipolar, and that's a very real thing. That's genetically inherited. But if you have mood swings during the day, if people, if you've ever seen somebody kind of look like, wow, what? There, that may be an indicator. They're seeing something because nobody shifts like that without a lot of stuff going on on the inside. It doesn't make you good, bad, or indifferent, but it just means there's probably something going on. And oftentimes, if somebody experiences that, they're going to also experience other issues. So those are all indicators that your body and your, your mind and emotions are trying to tell you that maybe something is unfinished. And we will continue, we'll look at what are the effects of divorce and also adult children of alcoholics, because oftentimes people will use alcohol to manage emotions. So we're gonna look at what are the effects that we might carry on and we might not connect. Uh, that's something that the stuff that happened in the past is still with us and therefore it needs to be grieved. We have losses, we have things that we went through that maybe we're buried alive. So we'll look at what are some of the effects. We'll look at that on the other side of the break as soon as I queue it up. So we'll see you back in a moment. Are you or someone you know a survivor of abuse and wondering where to turn for trustworthy help and insight into the effects of such abuse? Ever wish you had access to a resource that could help you continue your progress in healing? Survivorsupport.net is that resource. Developed by John Euler, a seasoned therapist with years of experience working with sexual abuse survivors, Survivorsupport.net is a one-of-a-kind resource to help you understand the impact of abuse and to help you understand the nature of those who harmed you in order to help you gain clarity, and continue healing. If you are interested in speaking with John Euler about your situation or in having John conduct a consultation or a training for your church or organization, SurvivorSupport.net serves as a convenient method of contacting him. Our program, Journey to Healing, is made possible through the generous donations of viewers like you. There are many opportunities and needs that Survivor Support is attempting to meet and your monthly support or one-time gift would be extremely helpful as we seek to meet those needs and opportunities. Simply visit SurvivorSupport.net and you will see the link to donate on the homepage. We thank you.